Rahul Bat, when the Wapu. And greetings to our YouTube family out there. Uh, I want to thank everyone for taking the time out to click on on our on this particular lecture. For those who don't know me, my name is Petty Sina Teptu Rae, and I'm a 30-year student teacher of the profound doctrine of the master teacher, known to us as Dr. Malachi Z.K. York, also known to us as Panabab Yananin, who has taught us our ancient culture, which we call Runawa, and which means uh, someone who is able to make decisions based on sound right reasoning is what Wap stands for and what we teach is that in order to do that you have to have the right knowledge and once you have the right knowledge that leads to one having the right wisdom and once one has the right wisdom that leads to one having the right understanding and it is by having that right understanding you're able to make decisions based on sound right reasonability and this is what we argue black people are lacking around the world globally our reasonability is shot and, and it shows in the living conditions that we're, we're suffering under very harsh living conditions and it's because of our decisions, our reasonability is, is shot and what we argue is the solution to the problem is having the right knowledge. Once you get the right knowledge then that leads to a pattern of things which is what we call Nawapu, sound right reasonability. So uh, we want to tell everybody out there uh, I'm a representative of nupu.org as well as nupucc.com. We, we always ask people to support what we do, to become members of, of nupucc.com, support that, our own social platform. It's, it's a counterbalance to, to the social media of Facebook, so we're asking people to help us build that platform up. And in addition to that, for those who are new, subscribe, right? Subscribe to us spread the word, tell other people about our lectures that we're doing, always thumbs up, support that, that helps us a lot when you, when you put thumbs up on our videos. So, this discussion today is talking about why do black people suffer worldwide? Why do black people suffer worldwide? That is the discussion. Five words why black people suffer worldwide. Five words. Five words. Word number one. Ignorance. Ignorance. <laughs> I mean, we, we're we suffering from profound ignorance. What do we mean when we say ignorance? Well, we're going to get into that. Okay. I mean, we're suffering from profound ignorance, though. Number two. Culture. The culture we're choosing to live. The culture that black people are choosing to live is causing us a great deal of pain. Culture. Number three, beliefs. Making decisions based on beliefs and not facts is causing black people a great deal of pain. Beliefs. Emotions. Making decisions based on emotional energy. Black people have a habit of making decisions based on high emotional energy. It's causing us great pain, great pain. And number five, number five is a compound word, irrational decisions. Black people are making irrational decisions at an alarming rate. And actually with each generation, it's gotten worse. With each generation, from if you, if you clock us from the 1920s, we were making irrational decisions, but in the 30s, it was worse. In the 40s, it was worse. In the 50s, it was worse. In the 60s, it was worse. In the 70s, boy, it was worse. That was pimping and hoeing in the 70s. In the 80s, crack, selling crack. I mean, it got worse. In the 90s, same thing with drugs and gangs, and it got worse. And in the 2000s, it's, it's bad, okay? Irrational decisions. So five things. It's causing suffering to black people. Ignorance, culture, beliefs, emotions, and irrational decisions. Irrational decisions, okay? 
So, let's see. Your ignorance, here's the key. Your ignorance to your Western cultural beliefs causes you to make emotional, irrational decisions. I'll repeat that again. Your ignorance to your Western cultural beliefs causes you to make emotional, irrational decisions. Okay, so we just combine them all in there. Yes. Okay. I'll repeat that again, guys. One more time. Your ignorance to your Western cultural beliefs causes you to make emotional, irrational decisions. I'll give you some examples. Why do you have children? Why do you have children, black people? If you begin to analyze why black people are having children, you begin to find out it's based on emotional, irrational decision. And it's because of Western cultural beliefs that you have rooted in your ignorance about it. Which is why you're having the children. Because ask yourself this question. Why is it that over 70% of black women are single with a child? Black women who have children, over 70% of them have no father in the house to help support them with that child. So the question then comes in, that was a emotional which wound up being an irrational decision and we learned that here in the western culture it's a belief system this is unfortunately they don't think that a lot of systems i should say don't see that as a problem now you do have a growing number of systems that do see that as a problem that the, the father is supposed to be in the lives that's something that never happened in the continent we didn't have these these fatherless children running around. But because of this culture and our ignorance to the negative effects of it, we're making an emotional decision about the female sees a guy, she likes that guy, but she's not thinking about, is he a good father? Is he gonna be there for the child? It's an emotional decision because you, she likes the guy, but it's really irrational because she doesn't even think, if I get pregnant by him, then what? And over 70% of our women are making these kind of decisions? So it's, it's a habitual, consistent thing. Which makes it what? Irrational. irrational. Yeah. It makes it irrational. Who? Why should children have to suffer not having both parents? It's an irrational decision that you learn here because of your Western cultural belief. They actually teach us, make it seem like it's okay. And it's very ignorant. It's a pretty disturbing epidemic. It is beyond catastrophic. Almost three quarters of you know, black children. It's at an alarming rate in the African American community. It is a crisis. It's devastating. The 72% number. 72%. 72%. 72%. 72%. More than 72% of children in the African American community are born out of wedlock. That means absent fathers. I wish I had had a father who was around in Baltimore. In 1965, Daniel Patrick Moynihan in his report said that 29% of African American children being born into out of wedlock households was a travesty. So if 29% is a travesty in 1965, what is 72% in 2013? 
sociologists, historians, lawyers, uh, and, and, and every other professional under the sun, they're studying to try to find out why exactly is this statistic so high. 72% of children being born to, uh, in, in African American communities to single parents is a frightening number. Not because black women aren't capable, not because it's morally wrong, but it, because it puts an economic pressure on the black community that we can ill afford. I think it's very important that we understand the history and in many ways the evolution as to the single parent home in the African American community. It goes back to pre-slavery days. In Africa, prior to um, the slave trade started, what you had is basically tight societies. Everybody was linked to the land and linked to a spiritual system. Spirituality affected everything you did. Single parenthood as a notion didn't, was not really present pre-colonization pre and pre-slavery. African men, broadly speaking, took care of their children in that in some societies they may have been responsible for um, rites of passage. So they taught the men how to be a man and they took them out and they taught them how to hunt and there were initiation ceremonies. You had a, a phenomenon where the institutions supported the men being there. The child was not necessarily property of their parents, it was a property of the family line. So there was no concept of a child sort of being on its own without no connection to anything. And so much so is a cultural term for it. Yeah. Baby daddy, baby mama, like that's supposed to be more. Another example, why do you get married? Why do you get married? When they say marriage is over 50% of marriages are ending in divorce. That sounds like a, no, a low number, but. That's what they said, over 50%, I don't know, you know, it, could, it, yeah. it may be higher than that. <laughs> so if you, if you wind up ending in divorce, that was an emotional decision, getting married, right? Mm -hmm. But I, it wound up being irrational because you got divorced. Because what did they say in the, you know, and the- um, Supposed to be till death do you yeah, part. Yeah, so they- so It sounds more like now till anger do you part or something like that. Yeah. So obviously it's a it's an emotional, irrational decision because you don't mean it. You're saying only death will you part from this individual, right? Mm -hmm. But it you don't mean that. So that's irrational. And you learned it from where? This Western, Western cultural, cultural, cultural belief system. Based on your ignorance of that particular type of cultural decision. But our people are getting married and they're being miserable in those marriages, it's bad decisions. Another example. Why do you buy expensive things? Why do black people buy expensive things? We're talking cars, jewelry. All cars. expensive things. It's usually an emotional decision. Why would you pay five, why, you know this guy, $500 for a pair of sneakers? Yeah. Now is that rational or irrational? Yeah, definitely rational. <laughs> Yeah, you know, well, I think Mike Tyson paid like a million dollars for some car or something. Yeah. Well, well, is that what, what's rational? His name? Didn't Master P pay a million dollars for that gold toilet yeah, or so, something? I guess so, <laughs> right? I think it was his bathroom or yeah. something. And, you know, it's just irrational. I think Jada Pinkett spent like 20000 on some curtains or something. Mm -hmm. These are irrational, emotional decisions that they learn where? In the Western, Western culture. culture. Their cultural their belief, belief systems. systems. Which is rooted in ignorance. Ignorance. It's rooted in ignorance. These are irrational decisions that our people are making every day, every single day, and you wonder why you're suffering. This is where suffering comes from. Irrational decisions. Literally. How many people in a professional sports were freaking what? Millionaires wind up broke.
my first contract, I think it was uh, six million dollars over over five years. Seven point six million, two point five million a year. Number one all time. That's that's the biggest NFL contract in NFL history for a defensive player. My first check was for like five hundred thousand. Thirty-three and a half million for seven years. And then I went on a splurge. <laughs> the first thing I bought for myself was a, uh, a Cadillac Escalade. I wanted earrings that, you know, were $30,000. I always wanted a Porsche, but didn't need the Porsche at the exact same time I had the Escalade and the tricked out Denali. Young athletes and their millions, the pitfalls of that much money. What is it about young guys coming into the league these days? What are the pressures on them that cause them to get into that position? I lost two houses back to back. I lost four houses. Man, you keep this up, you could be broke. I ended up to the point where I was broke. I'm just here to tell you, man, it doesn't last forever. Before you know it, looked up, I was broke. Money brings women. One of the funniest things I heard uh, was that for women, it's this thing that you can, um, you can apply to. You know, you got all these blogging sites and stuff, and it's called Baller Alert. Our slogan is, you know, for women who want to live the ballerific life. When Michael Jordan was playing for the Wizards, at the time I was the VIP coordinator for one of the hottest clubs, a block away from the MCI Center where Michael Jordan played. We had a radio broadcast at the time and it was a live broadcast going on. We shouted out that Michael Jordan was in the club and maybe an hour later, 2,000 girls showed up. This is how serious this thing is. When a baller shows up to a place, you receive a text on your phone so you can get nice and cute and go out and try and catch you a baller. I had 7,000 girls signed up. Wow. Women, they take notice. They see. They see the guys that are spending money. They see how they dress. And so we go get the money to entertain and appease the women. <laughs> if it wasn't about women, you think a lot of guys would purchase a big rope chain or, 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 or a fancy car? Probably not. You know, you got women about telling you how cute you are when, you know, I was an ugly duckling maybe just a month ago. The players complain about the gold diggers, but they do everything possible to attract them. When you step away and the camera goes off and the flashing lights and the cheers go away, a lot of these guys don't know who they're with. That's why divorce rates are so high amongst professional athletes. 60% of players are divorced three years out of ball. 60%. First thing about your career, you'd go back and do over if I gave you a chance. You've got to have something you'd like to go back and not have bought with your pro money. Um, my ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> sure as heck don't go into a marriage thinking it's going to end. You don't budget aside two million bucks to say, oh, this is reserved for when I divorce in 12 years. Post my career, I kind of knew there's some things going on within my personal life and within my family that wasn't going to be financially very beneficial. Ended up getting divorced. And there was a lot of similarities between um, my ex-wife and my, my father. If it made him happy to get it all, then, got, then go for it, because it just isn't worth the aggravation. Former player Mariana Simonescu said in the divorce settlement, I didn't ask for much, only that I live comfortably for the rest of my life. The high, high, high price of Greg Norman's divorce. Did, did I mention high? It's, it's high, Bob. All of a sudden, you have double the expenses because your spouse is going to, if you don't have a prenup, is going to get some of that money. It's going to get a lot of that money, maybe even half of that money. Even if you're Michael Jordan, look what happened to him in his divorce. He had to pay over $150 million to his ex-wife. He did not have a prenuptial agreement. We've all heard about the incident involving Tiger Woods. Nordgren would not disclose the amount of the divorce settlement, but did say money can't buy happiness or put her family back together. Children are very expensive. I have two children, and I can't tell you how expensive these kids are. I love them to death, but they're expensive. How many children do you have, Trey? I got nine. With how many different women? Nine. His child support payments now total $17,000 per month, which was more affordable when Henry was still collecting NFL paychecks. Players that are providing child support while they're playing, they go from $1 million a year to zero. Clearly, you need an attorney to, um, to go to the courts and see if they can get those adjusted. But most players fail to do that. Holyfield pays hundreds of thousands annually to support the 11 children he's fathered by nine different women. Jason Caffey, who has fathered 10 children by eight women, 
Although he played eight years in the NBA, earning more than $28 million has left a trail of unpaid child support. Their lifespan in, in their careers will not be long. Then what happens? They're not going to be able to afford to raise these children based on the lifestyle that they've created now. And those consequences will be dire emotionally and financially for the women involved and the children. The money gone, the fame and fortune gone, so do that woman. She, she, she be gone too. Emotional, irrational decisions. Because why? They're spending that money on expensive stuff. They wind up dirt poor. I mean, it. it, it I, we can kind of go on. Uh, let's see. Uh, you got more examples? Why don't you want to? Why don't black people want to connect with Africa? No, An uh, emotional, irrational decision. What, what are those? They taught Africa is full of AIDS, poverty, violence. Yeah, violence. Right? There's nothing those there. Those Africans don't want you. No. You're a slave baby. I mean, the list goes on. Is is that black people will think to go to Paris before they think to go to Ghana? People go to China before they go. To Nigeria. Yeah, they want to go to they want to go to Tokyo before they go to South Africa or whatever. I mean, our concept of one not wanting to go to Africa is it's really an irrational decision, especially when you look at the Chinese are in Africa, the Indians are in Africa, the Arabs are in Africa, the Caucasians are everybody going to Africa but us. Taking advantage of the wealth of Africa, except Africans who live outside of Africa. And why? Because you have an irrational, emotional, irrational decision that you're making based on ignorance, a belief system, a cultural belief system you learned here. We learn to think of Africa in a negative way here in the West. And it goes back, that's why I gave you those movies. It goes back again to those, those films, those are propaganda films. You know, which is why they were calling us, look at the savages, and blah, blah, we gotta, blah. We got to reference the movies again. This is a yeah. video. Well, I'll just put them up. Yeah, put them up so people can see. Some They had these propaganda films, which were designed, guys, to make, to show white people how primitive black people were, and to also just to, to make black people disassociate with being African, make you feel bad and self-conscious about it.
So this is it's to get you to make an emotional, irrational decision about who you are, your ancestry. It, it's that simple. And we're suffering because of it. That's the key. Why do black people suffer? We're suffering because of those five things, right? Those five words. And so, as you say, your ignorance, the culture you're choosing to, to partake in, the fact that you make decisions based on beliefs, the fact that you're using emotions to make your decisions, strong emotions, right? And it's usually irrational. All right, let's see. All judgment must be made based on sound right reasonability. This is what we teach. To get away from irrational decisions, you have this, what we teach is that all judgments, all your decisions should be made on based on sound right reasonability. And that's what we call Nuwapu. Okay? This is what we call Nuwapu. Now, Black people's refusal to adhere to Nawapu will continue to cause mass suffering. In Nawapu, what we're saying is that you don't, you don't, you research things, you investigate things before you make a decision on something. You do not allow irrational, how can I say, Ill, emotional, irrational decisions to influence you. Don't let emotions get the best of you when it comes to making your decisions. That's the key. And don't allow what you've been taught in Western culture to influence your decisions. We have to think outside of the cultural conditions that they did because getting people to make irrational decisions was a plot and design by Corporations who came up with this, very smart Caucasian people. That we, we talked about this once before about Edward Benet, the, uh, the grand, no, the nephew of Sigmund Freud. That's right. And that was a teaching of Sigmund Freud that humans were prone to making irrational decisions. And Edward Benet, who was, the, who was considered to be the father of public relations and marketing and propaganda, he used that knowledge about psychology. He was learning from his uncle, Sidney Ford, how to influence people to make irrational decisions, like smoking. That's one of those irrational decisions where you're getting pleasure from something that's killing you. That's not rational. Bernays set out to experiment with the minds of the popular classes. His most dramatic experiment was to persuade women to smoke. At that time, there was a taboo against women smoking, and one of his early clients, George Hill, the president of the American Tobacco Corporation, asked Bernays to find a way of breaking it. He said, we're losing half of our market because men have invoked a taboo against women smoking in public. Can you do anything about that? I said, let me think about it. And then I said, have I your permission to see a psychoanalyst to find out what cigarettes mean to women? He said, what'll it cost? So I called up Dr. Brill, A.A. Brill, who was a leading psychoanalyst in New York at that time. How come you didn't call your uncle? Why didn't you call your uncle? Because he was in Vienna. A.A. Brill was one of the first psychoanalysts in America. And for a large fee, he told Bernays that cigarettes were a symbol of the penis and of male sexual power. He told Bernays that if he could find a way to connect cigarettes with the idea of challenging male power, then women would smoke, because then they would have their own penises. Every year, New York held an Easter Day parade to which thousands came. And Bernays decided to stage an event there. He persuaded a group of rich debutantes to hide cigarettes under their clothes. Then they should join the parade, and at a given signal from him, they were to light up the cigarettes dramatically. Bernays then informed the press that he had heard that a group of suffragettes were preparing to protest by lighting up what they called torches of freedom. 
he knew this would be an outcry and he knew that all of the photographers would be there to capture this moment and so he was ready with a phrase which was torches of freedom and so here you have a symbol women young women debutantes smoking a cigarette in public with a phrase that means anybody who believes in this kind of equality pretty much has to support them in the ensuing debate about this because torches of freedom i mean what's on all american coins it's liberty she's holding up the torch you see and so all of this is there together there's emotion there's memory there's a rational phrase even though it's using a lot of emotional elements it's a it's a phrase that works in a rational sense uh, all of this is together and so the next day this was not just in all of the new york papers it was across the united states and around the world and from that point forward uh, the sale of cigarettes to women began to rise. He had made them socially acceptable with a single symbolic act. What Bernays had created was the idea that if a woman smoked, it made her more powerful and independent. An idea that still persists today. Embrace me, my sweet embrace. It made him realize that it was possible to persuade people to behave irrationally if you link products to their emotional desires and feelings. The idea that smoking actually made women freer was completely irrational, but it made them feel more independent. It meant that irrelevant objects could become powerful emotional symbols of how you wanted to be seen by others. Eddie Bernays saw the way to sell product was not to sell it to your intellect, that you ought to buy an automobile, but that you will feel better about it if you have this automobile. I think he originated that idea, that they weren't just purchasing something, but they were engaging themselves, emotionally or personally, in, in the product or service. That it's not, you, you think you need a new piece of clothing, but you'll feel better with the piece of clothing. That was his contribution in a very real sense. We see it all over the place today, but I think he originated the idea of the emotional connect to a product or service. In fact, the whole advertisement market, corporate corporations, they use advertisement campaigns to influence people emotionally into irrational concepts about their products. That's why when you watch a lot of commercials, it really not, doesn't have anything to do with the product. It's designed, the commercials are designed to get an emotional response out of an individual where they can relate something to the product. Like some, usually they use sex, right? Yeah. They use athletic abilities. They try to get you to relate either sex to a product or, you know, irrational decision. Like if you eat this hamburger, it's gonna make you like strong, like Popeye with Pop spinach. With yeah. <laughs> or just yeah. something funny or endearing. Cause it reminds me of the Super Bowl. They had those, uh, the, the beer commercials where they have like with the frogs burping the yes. Budweiser. Yes. Or they have the thing with the horses and they kick yeah. the football all over the thing. and it's Something like, that's yeah. irrational, <laughs> literally, yeah. that puts a stamp in your mind. Guys, that's a psychological, those are psychological tactics that's being played on us and it's having an impact on our day-to-day -day de day -day decisions. And this is causing us a great deal of pain because of the fact that end result, I mean, think about it. Who wants to get married then while they're getting divorced? Well, nobody. You wouldn't get married if you could. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And horribly. Exactly. And everybody be upset. You wind up in a great deal of pain. Honestly, all you women out there who have children, you really didn't want to have the father in their lives? Do you really think they wanted to go through that? No, of course. Honestly? So these are, these are some profound decisions that we're making. You know, think about the people, now this is for elders, right? Think about all the money, if you're for elders out there, all the money they spend on irrational things. A lot of them could imagine have been millionaires. If yeah, imagine. <laughs> the, I mean, it's, we're, we're suffering because of these, these types of decisions that we're making, because we learned it right here in this insane culture. And we don't understand all of our suffering is coming from this type of thinking.
Literally, we learned it here. It starts with ignorance. It is the ignorance that opens the gateway for all of this. Because we're completely ignorant about the European cultural ideals. We're just ignorant about that. And obviously it's by design because they don't teach you. They honestly do not teach you anything about their culture. You have to study it yeah. on your own because they're not going to tell you about them. Smoking with Chantix and support. Talk to your doctor about Chantix and a support plan that's right for you. Some people have had changes in behavior, hostility, agitation, depressed mood, and suicidal thoughts or actions while taking or after stopping Chantix. If you notice agitation, hostility, depression, or changes in behavior, thinking, or mood that are not typical for you, or if you develop suicidal thoughts or actions, stop taking Chantix and call your doctor right away. Talk to your doctor about any history of depression or other mental health problems, which can get worse while taking Chantix. Some people can have allergic or serious skin reactions to Chantix, some of which can be life-threatening. If you notice swelling of face, mouth, throat, or a rash, stop taking Chantix and see your doctor right away. Tell your doctor which medicines you're taking, as they may work differently when you quit smoking. Chantix dosing may be different if you have kidney problems. The most common side effect is nausea. Patients also reported trouble sleeping and vivid, unusual, or strange dreams. Until you know how Chantix may affect you, use caution when driving or operating machinery. Chantix should not be taken with other quit smoking products. The urges weren't like they used to be, and that helped me quit. Talk to your doctor to find out if prescription Chantix is right for you. This is Dr. Peter Bregan, and this is another in my Simple Truths about Psychiatry. And the subject today is that psychiatric drugs are much, much more dangerous than you've ever, ever been led to believe by the doctors who are prescribing them. I genuinely believe that if most people knew how dangerous the psychiatric drugs really were, most people would never start on them. And I also believe that if most prescribers had even the faintest idea how dangerous they were, they'd stop prescribing them. Well, how is it that so many people can be ignorant about psychiatric drugs? Well, the truth is because they're all getting their information from the drug companies. I mean, when was the last time you saw a car company leap up to tell people way in advance that they'd had some deaths on the road from their bad breaks? When was the last time a car companies went mea culpa and said, yes, uh, our accelerators are sticking and running people down? Well, I can tell you the drug companies are even worse. They go to all kinds of extremes to avoid letting you know and letting your doctor know how dangerous the drugs are. I know this because I've been a medical expert in dozens of lawsuits against drug companies. I've looked inside drug companies and seen what they're really doing. I was appointed by a court in Indiana to be the scientific expert for over 150 lawsuits against Eli Lilly, suits alleging that the drug Prozac had caused violence, suicide, mayhem, mania, and psychosis. So I know what goes inside. I know as much as anyone about how dangerous the drugs are. So let me just give you a little brief outline of material you can find in the first half of my book, Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. Obviously, the second half is intended to help you come off psychiatric drugs because it can be very dangerous to come off drugs. It's dangerous and sometimes more than starting the drugs. Let's take a look at the stimulants that you may be taking as a college student or as a parent that you may be giving to your children. Follow-up studies 
on people who were started on stimulants as children show that they have shrinkage of brain tissue measurable on brain scans. They have reduced height and weight. They're being incarcerated more often than other people. They're going to mental hospitals more often. Their suicide rate has increased. Every single one of these facts documented by follow-up studies of what happens to you if you get started on stimulants. And one particularly well-done study, the rate of cocaine abuse is greater when you become a young man or woman if you've been put on stimulants as a child. That's because the stimulant drugs such as uh, Ritalin and Concerta and Adderall and Dexedrine, uh, they're so similar to cocaine in their effects. Let's keep it going. Let's see. Being black is the key. Oh, let me just say this. We keep saying, I'll repeat this, we argue that Nawapo is the solution to these problems. Making decisions based on sound, right, reason, ability. That's why we're even doing these lectures, because that is the solution to all the suffering that we're dealing with. Okay? The key, the key to Nawapo, though, is that you, we have to condition ourselves to get to the point where we can let go of the European culture. But we can't do it as an individual. We have to do it as a collective. And this is something that the master teacher, Dr. York, has been trying to do, and it's hard. It's really hard. That's why he's sitting in a jail cell, literally because he's trying to get black people to live up for and by each other who have been conditioned to want to serve the interests of Caucasian men. It's hard. And we turn on each other because we honestly are so how can I say, wired to, to, to want to partake in Caucasian culture and we turn on each other when it comes to that. And I'm telling you, we're going to continue to suffer as long as we embrace a culture of suffering. So I just wanted to say that. Now let's move on. Now, check this out. Being black caused you to be emotional because melanin, melanin, is what make black people uh, black, which is what allows us to have emotions like compassion, consideration, empathy, remorse, regret, love, pain, and pleasure. This is the this is what the the the, the, the what we call the molecule melanin. It's actually an emotion genetic. Gene. How does melanin do that? Ah, first thing, let me just say this. Study Jill Pokram, she goes into it, right? Layla Africa, he goes into it, right? Dr. Layla Africa, Dr. Jill Pokram will put her book up. Dr. Layla Africa will put his book up, right? Uh, we have Dr. Richard King, okay? He goes into it. Also, as Nuwapians, uh, we also recommend getting the book, Genetic Kiss. Genetic Kiss. Okay? We go into it. Also get the book, the, um, in, what's that? Intelligent Designer Gene. Intelligent. Those are two different. Uh, no, intelligent that's design. design. Intelligent Design. Divine Design. Yes. Or Plot of those, those, those particular books. Melanin. Melanin. What is melanin? Melanin absorbs energy. Melanin absorbs energy. Energy from where? Sun energy. Melanin absorbs sun energy. What is emotion? E stands for energy in motion. So all emotion means energy that's in motion. Black people have the most emotions because we have the most energy because we have the most melanin. This comes out in athletics in black people. This comes out in entertainment in black people, which is why you see black people are big into song and dance. Going back to Africa, we're always dancing, we're always singing because we have to release that energy, literally. And it's an energy 
that puts us in harmony with nature because it's the same energy that grew the planet. So we can fill the earth. That's why black people are peaceful people by nature because we fill the heartbeat of the earth. The earth is a living entity and we can fill that. Appreciate the introduction. This evening we're going to talk about something uh, called melanin. It's what everyone is concerned about in the world. It's what they have a meeting about every three to five years. Germany, Italy, France, the U.S., they meet every three to five years and have a melanin convention and discuss the latest research in melanin. They have never invited a black scientist to that meeting in history. So we have had our own melanin conferences where we discuss this information involving melanin. Melanin is commonly associated with the pigment that causes your skin to be brown. So we figure that that's what melanin is about. But it's a little more than just the pigment that makes your skin brown. It's what we call a chemical key to life. The more melanin you have, the more civilized you are. The more melanin you have, the more psychic you are. The more melanin you have, the more information your brain can store. The more melanin you have, the faster the nerve transmissions are. The more melanin you have, the more sound you absorb in your ear, so you hear the full range of sound. No other race can do that. The more melanin you have, the more color you can absorb in your eyes. That's why your eyes are brown you actually see the full color. You see this color where white folks see a pale at tan because the more melanin you have, the more you can see what God has meant for you to see. The more melanin you have in your taste buds, the more you can taste the full flavor of the food. No other race can taste an apple like you can because they can't absorb the full flavor because you need melanin to absorb the full flavor of food. That's why we combine food differently from other races, because we actually can taste the food. That's because of the high amount of melanin we have, which we sometimes take for granted. Melanin is the chemical key to life. There is nothing else to study in science but melanin. We call it chemi, which means black. The people who study melanin particles call what they're studying, the science is called chemistry, what you call chemistry, the study of melanin particles that go around in an orbit, and we call them electrons, protons, solitons. Those are melanin particles. That's why we call it chemistry. And the country you come from is called chemit, which some people call Egypt. There is nothing else to study but melanin. And if you study chemistry or heard of chemistry and haven't heard the word melanin, you have just been studying social science. You go into a classroom and you call it biology, but biology is the way melanin controls the cell. And we call that little melanin sitting in the cell the new sun, the nucleus. The new sun radiates information and tells the cell how to operate, how to think, how to digest. That's melanin. Biology is the study of melanin and how it communicates. There's nothing else to study in if you're going into the living sciences. Melanin plays a part in your historical memory. The more melanin you have, the more you're connected to your ancestors. You can pull on thoughts that you didn't even know were there because melanin gives you ancestral memory. That's based on melanin. That's how we classify races, based on their melanin content. It's not the quality of melanin in your skin we're talking about. It doesn't mean a light-skinned brother is less black than you are. We're talking about the melanins produced inside their body by the pineal gland. That's the melanin we measure. Every living thing has to have melanin. White people have it, but they have a lesser amount. And their melanin is different from your melanin. Their melanin has sulfur in the middle, and your melanin has selenium in the middle. 
are two different types of melanin that could not biologically come down the same tree. That's physiologically impossible for a white person to evolve from a black person. It's two different melanins. That's why every scientist says that theory of evolution we never say is a fact. Never say it's the theory of evolution. It's not a fact. Now, here we go. The races of humans. This is how races are classified according to white people. Not according to me. This is not Dr. Africa said. This is according to John Hopkins University, Emory University. This is how they classify races. Rated one with the lowest melanin content is the Caucasians. Rated two and three are the yellow mix and brown race, which you call the Orientals. Rated four are the brown and red people, Native Americans and Japanese. Rated five are the black, brown, and brown people, which we call the Native Indians from Mexico. The Mexicans, Himalayas, you know that race I'm talking about? Rated six with the highest melanin content is black folks. You are rated the highest on the human scale by white people. Did you know that? No. That would present a problem. You go in the classroom and they, say, they start breaking this thing down to you. You say, we rated the highest on the human scale here. And you say, okay. And we come from Africa. Okay. Uh, that means I can think better than you. I may not think faster than you, but I can outthink you. Yeah. So, okay, okay, uh, is this stuff I'm making up? And I say, no, you're not making up. You really respond to life better than I do. Then they start showing you books, The Magical Child by Joseph Pierce. Then they start to show you another book, Infancy in Uganda by Mary Ainsworth. And these are books about them studying black children whose mother was on natural food and breastfed and father was on natural food and breastfed. And they study these children and the child's born with these parents could sit up at birth, look his mother and father in his eye, know its name, know his mother and father's name at birth. Document it. The Magical Child by Joseph Pierce. They didn't believe it. They went back 10 years again, again and studied the same thing. Same thing happened. They didn't believe it. Mary Ainsworth went back and studied it. My emphasis in Uganda. Same thing. Yes, you grow at a faster rate than white people. You have the highest, the fastest growth and development of a child than any race. You can be toilet fed, toilet trained at one year old. It takes a white child two years for their nerve to grow to that muscle that controls their bladder. You're raising your children like retards and wondering what's happening. Because nobody told you you had melanin. Nobody told you it causes you to have the highest growth and development. Nobody told you it lear you learn how to toilet train earlier. No one told you you learn how to speak earlier. No one told you. Why should they tell you that anyway? You think they're going to tell you something so you want to be free? This is what the Caucasian lacks because of their lack of melanin and a disease of leprosy that they're suffering from, they have a respiratory issue and it disconnects them, okay? Literally, every race, each race, because they're, they have a, they have, how can I say? They're not as connected as the African race because they don't have the same energy frequency that the African does that makes us more in harmony with nature, more at peace with nature. So I was watching, and maybe we can show this, in one of those uh, films, and back in the day, and uh, they was filming in Africa, and there was a particular trap. Something happened to a lion. I think a lion attacked somebody, right? Mm -hmm. This is done in the 1930s. So the, there's a, there was like um, special, like the special forces, African brothers, who specialized in capturing and killing lions, right? Okay. So they had to go get a lion because it, I, I forget why he was wanting to get this lion, but they went to get this lion, to kill a lion, because I think it attacked or killed somebody. So it was like 10 of them, 
right? And they got this special whatever outfit, and they got their shield, and they got their spear, and they go to hunt the lion. And it was a female lion, right? The female lion. And so they go in, and so she, I guess she know they, they trying to get her, so she like, I'm gonna get y'all first. <laughs> and so, so the female lion, she comes, man, and this brother, he gets up in front of her, whatever, and he has a shield up, and attacks, attacks his shield, the lion falls over, he falls back, and as the lion falls over, the other brothers whoop with the spears and get her. Okay. And her husband was there. Mm. They didn't know that. Her husband was there, and he comes down charging after them. And another brother would have the same thing. He hit the shield, you know, he fall over, and they get him, boom. And they, they throw the spears. But here's the thing, here's the key, the point, right? After the kill, the lions, they successfully killed both lions. The brothers, they take their shields, they go, they put their shields down on the grass, they take their spears, they put their spears down on the grass, they all sit in a row, and it's like they're praying and they're, and they're sorrowful for the lion. Mm. They show a sense of compassion. Something a white man can't even, no, he, can't, can't, he, can't, he, can't, he can't even comprehend that. No. It's funny you say that about the lion, because I've seen a lot of pictures now, the poaching pictures. Mm -hmm. they be, like cheesing, smiling, with their rifles, laying all on the animals, like they have a joy out of killing stuff. And just... For those who don't understand the, the science of melanin, the, I mean, God, think about it. Think about all the abuse that we as black people suffer under the hands of Caucasians and we've yet to rebel. Nobody accepts the level of abuse like black people. In fact, that's why they think we're weak. They think, they, they see it as a weakness. Our sense of natural nature nonviolence. We're not a violent people by nature. The craziness that 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 people see us do right now to each other is based on we're releasing violence on each other because of the cultural conditions of one another. But we're not a violent people. You see that at um even after the genocide, the so-called conflict in Rwanda, how the people held each other, they forgave each other for, for, for that, that trauma of that war. You know, the brothers and sisters in, in Rwanda, they, they forgave each other because it's the only way to heal. And, and so, no, we, we have a unique, a uniqueness in that, in us. And we all know about the, 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 the fights, man. Yeah. If the Fahites are a peaceful people by nature. It's it's in our blood, it's in our DNA, it's in our genes that, that we're, we're, we're not that. That doesn't mean we don't have a violent streak, we do. But we're nothing like the other races of people on the planet. That's just not who we are. So remember that. What, what we have to keep in mind about melanin, I will say is it, it, let me just say this, it's sad that we are melanated people, but we don't understand the science of melanin. Now, I'll say the Caucasian is not going to teach you this, guys. They're not going to teach you this. If you want to conquer the suffering, then it's important, it's imperative that we understand the science of emotional energy and comprehending our genetics, our natural nature genetics. Now like Dr. Savi, he, he argued about melanin and what he argued that it's really copper, which I want him a thousand percent. It's you mean carbon? Copper. Oh, he said it was copper. No, I thought it was carbon. No, he said carbon, I'm yeah. sorry. Excuse me, <laughs> carbon. <laughs> carbon, right, which is what? The sixth element in the periodic table which is a burning sus a, a burning substance, right? And so here's it's the, it's the blackness. It's the blackness. In order for something to be black, it it has to it, and and burn. It has to have energy. There has to be some something to ignite that blackness. And that's what we call electrical or an ether energy. It's just the same thing. It's all melanin is doing. Melanin is processing electrical energy into the body. That's all it does. Okay. And we as black people, with Willie here, we're able to pull in the most sun ether. So, how do we keep ourselves in harmony so that we're not suffering? 
right? Because a lot of the emotional, irrational decisions that we're making is due to the fact of the cultural lifestyle we're living. That's the root of the cause of it, is European Western culture, for instance. Some of the things we do in their culture that we wouldn't do in African culture, like be indoors 90% of, of the time. That's a European thing. Everything is inside something. Inside a house, inside your car, inside your workplace. When you go shopping, you're inside a shopping mall. It's always indoors, okay? African-based culture is the opposite. You're outdoors. This is why black people here in the West have a vitamin D deficiency, which means we're lacking sunlight, sun energy. We belong outdoors 90% of the time, not indoors. And so that has a negative adverse effect on us and it's helping with making negative bad decisions. We're supposed to be, we are an outdoor people. The Caucasians are an indoor people. We're opposite. Our diet, the food. If you want to know what food we're supposed to eat and what we don't, and what we, what these foods are doing to us, just study what Dr. Savi was teaching. Study what Layla Africa teaches. We have a lot of brothers out there that are teaching our people what we're supposed to be eating. I can tell you right now, the Western diet is poison. It just is. It's poison. So that's helping with making, helping us make irrational decisions. It's the diet. It's what we're feeding ourselves and our children. It's not our fault because we were forced into this diet by who? The Caucasian. We're eating his diet. You want to change that? You have to change that. Or at least change it for your children. These are the solutions to, to the problem. This is why we're suffering. We're suffering because we're living a foreign culture that's not susceptible to our natural nature. That's why I recommended the books, that the books we put out as the whopping is Genetic Kiss, right? And that, I keep forgetting the name of that book. The, the, we'll put it up. <laughs> the naturally designed, plot of aliens, whatever. Intelligent design, divine design, and yeah. plot of aliens. Yeah, so I highly recommend for, for you guys out there to get that particular book because it's important about genetics. Genetics, genetics, genetics is everything, okay? So the, the suffering that we, we're dealing with is due to the fact, it goes back to your ignorance is first and then the culture. And Caucasian culture is designed to make you make decisions based on your beliefs because it, it, it what they do is condition us to make emotional, irrational decisions. And that's why I was talking about the advertising. The advertising is designed to get you to do that. So, listen, you'll be helping yourself if you turn off their televisions. It's, it's, it's very few people are going to do like me. I'm constantly studying. It's not that I don't participate in European culture, because I do. I live here. It's impossible for us not to participate. But some of the things I try to do to help offset it is by constantly studying African cultural principles and trying to focus on creating a cultural lifestyle that geared towards that. That's what we also must be striving for. This is what we as Munwapu are striving for, as we call ourselves today as Sabians, Sabian people, those who identify with the creative sons of the universe. We, come, we are children of the sun, and we have a sun-based culture, not a moon-based culture, which is the children of the moon, the Caucasian. They're the moon children. That's the children of the shadow. We're the children of the night and the children of the sun, okay? And so we need to identify with that culture. So, now, let's see. Why do black people suffer worldwide is what we're talking about. Some of the problems that, that, that's causing the suffering is black people cannot unite within their own family bloodlines. This is, this is a huge problem of suffering. In, internal family conflicts. Father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, sister against brother, daughter against father, 
father against uh, brother, father against mother, brother against mother. I mean, some brutal internal family conflicts. How can we unite as a people and we can't even unite as an individual family? Some of our people's worst adversaries, family members. Mm. I, this is why I would argue as us as Munwapo, as the Wapians, we've always advocated live of, for, and by each other. This is something that the master teacher has pushed hardcore. We got to do it. This is not an option. We have to do it. This is, we live as a tribe. African people live as a tribe. We must unite. We must, we must come to together work. as people physically. Because that's where we have our strength. And that's the hardest thing. The devil taught us not to unite, not to get along. Your father, you look at the people get along, the Orientals, look how powerful they are. The Jews got together when they was without a homeland, and what they do? Look how powerful they are. They dictate the world now. The Italians got together under Mussolini and massacred us while we was in Ethiopia. We're the only people that won't come together. The hardest thing to get y'all to do is to move together. And every successful group of people move together. And they work from a, from a center out. Not from the outside, hey, but I'll be later. I'll be And people think we, want, we don't want you in there because we want something. Listen, when you're on the outside, you're more profitable to us than on the inside. People don't understand that. When you're outside, you're buying books and stuff, you're benefiting us. When you come in, you stop buying. So why do you, if we want the money, why are we telling you to move in? We should tell you, stay outside and buy our books. <laughs> so people think by me saying, come in, that I want something from you. No, I know that we got to get together to get the power, and it's going to cost us, as we get in, less bread is on the table, because we got to break another piece. Do you understand? But that is our problem as a people. If we do not come together, and I know many leaders have come and said the same thing. We've got to come together. And our power is in our unity. Everybody said that. Kampo said it. Elijah Muhammad said it. Marcus Garvey said it. Every leader we ever had on any one of the continents that we stood on said our power is in our unity. But for some reason, we will not drop our necks and become fishers of men. That's the first thing Jesus said to the disciples. He said, drop your necks and become fishers of men. Why? Because when they first met him in St. John's chapter 1, what did they say to him? They was walking, they said, where are you going? You don't believe me? Read St. John's chapter 1. They said to Jesus, where are you going? He said, I'm going home. Why? If you read the next part, it says because the Sabbath was coming in. Right? He said, I'm going home. And they said, well, can we go with you? He said, sure. He invited him to his house. And they never left. Mm -hmm. They spent the Sabbath and the next three and a half years with him. That was a sign. And then he said later on in Revelation, for the future sign, I stand at the door and I knock. And anybody who opens up, I will sup with them. Right? These men, I come and I'll be with you. But getting y'all to come together is like pulling teeth out of a lion with a steak suit on. <laughs> That's difficult. <laughs> Trying to get y'all to just unite. The only solution to the suffering that we're dealing with under a Caucasian system of racism, white supremacy, and global capitalism is to get back to tribal living, right? But how do we get back to tribal living and we can't even live as individual families, can't even get together? And this is why I argue why, you know, we as the have, have have had such a difficult time having, you know, the communities. Because in the communities, we're trying to bring black people from different cultural backgrounds together under one umbrella. Now, of course, everyone who come up under that umbrella is supposed to accept the same culture of Wunawa. That's great in, from an idealistic point of view, but not so great in a practical point of view because we've been dipped in European ways and habits and belief systems. And that just, that just doesn't leave. 
This is why the master teacher is sitting in the jail cell now because of the fact that people who was who was physically a part of our, our culture but not mentally a part of our culture. They still wanted to be a part of the Caucasian. Why? That's why they ran to the Caucasian and, you know, say, Master, Master, this man here, this black guy did this to us and did that to us and you need to do something about it. That's a sickness. That's a sickness among us as a people, always seeing the Caucasian as authority. Literally. Brothers try to argue, well, they had to go to the white man because if they didn't go to the white man, nobody would did nothing in the Nawapi Nation. It's like, okay, what, what is that saying about yourself? And you try to figure out why you're suffering. Because mm. you don't see yourself as a, as a source of authority. No, a source of a solution. You know, yeah, you don't see yourself as a source of solution. You see the Caucasian as a solution to your problems. Because that goes back to seeing them as God. You see, yeah. God will handle it. God will take care of it. That's a sickness, man. You know, I hear that so much now. And before in the past, people say, let go and let God. Let God deal with it. It's like, yeah, wow. it's a sickness. <laughs> That's that beliefs. It's yeah. the beliefs. It's the cultural beliefs. That leads you to make irrational, emotional decisions. Because they went crying, crying to the white man, all emotional. Mm. And then making it irrational. How can your natural born adversary ever help you? When has a Caucasian ever cared about black people, black adults, black women, black children? When have they ever showed any care for us? All we have done is suffer under their rulership globally, everywhere. And yet, we think there's some kind of solution. No, it's a big problem among the black family. And yes, the, the, we have, this, it's not an option we gotta come together and work as a people united. That's not an option, that has to happen. But what I am saying is that we have to figure out if, as family, I mean, if you can't, it's hard trying to get your own children. And, you know, it's hard. And, you know, and obviously, a lot of it has to do with we're bombarded day in and day out by the Caucasian advertisements on us. It plays on our psyche. Not to mention we will allow our children to be educated by them. Mm. And we see them as a source of education, as a source of intelligence. That's a, uh, that's a problem, guys. <laughs> You know, that, that brings me to the next uh, statement. Black people continue to make decisions that keep themselves in a subservient position. And you wonder why you're suffering. I repeat, black people continue to make decisions that keep themselves in a, in a subservient position, such as black people re refuse to think outside of the mind of Caucasian people. You give... You're, you get way too much praise to people who have like PhDs, the professional class. That's a big mistake. That's a big mistake. We give a lot of credit and praise to brothers and sisters who got the PhDs, these doctorates from the Caucasian. That's why Umar is a prince of Pan-Africanism. He gets a lot of he gets a lot of how can I say accolades and people listen to him because he has a PhD. Yeah. Same thing with the brother, um, Doctor Bo Bo Bryce. Bruce Bryce Walker. Bruce Walker. Yeah, well, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, guys, now use your thinking cap. Put your thinking cap on. The most effective black men in the history of the United States did not have PhDs. And they would have been the most effective teachers and had the most profound doctrine of all the PhDs put together, quadruple. Yeah. Noble Jarali did not have a PhD. Some of them didn't even finish regular school in here. Right. Okay. Marcus Garvey did not have a PhD. Mm -hmm. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad did not have a PhD. These men were more successful then all the PhDs that the Caucasian produce among black people, okay? Mm. Malcolm X did not have a PhD, guys, mm. okay? The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan does not have a PhD. And 
and doctor you up. He does not have a PhD. What's funny about that, even when you look in their world and their successful people, the most successful creative people in their world did not have PhDs. Yeah, look did at not finish though. school. Henry Ford, he's one of them. Yeah. He didn't have a PhD. Nikola Tesla. Right. <laughs> he didn't, that's right, Nikola, you know what? Nikola, Nikola Tesla, Tesla he had as much PhD. stuff as he didn't contribute. Who told you guys <laughs> that you supposed to be up under people with a PhD? Where y'all get, you got that from, from that brainwash. You got that from, because, you know, unfortunately, Sonetta, he pushes that. He pushes that. I'm talking about the, 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 the chains on our minds now. I'm talking about the inner freedom. I'm talking about the freedom that is keeping the African from getting free. Secondly, dependency. We don't know how to do for ourselves. We don't know how to do that. And I mean, it makes sense. I mean, if you haven't done anything for yourself in four centuries, you forget. I mean, you, you really don't know. You, I mean, you know, we, we don't know how to organize things. We don't know how to make things run correctly for us. Right. We don't know how to make things serve our own self-interest. We end up sabotaging our own effectiveness because we always want to depend on someone else to take care of it. That's right. Now look, there is no reason in the world for us to believe that European Americans will ever educate our children That's correctly. Right. Ain't no reason in the world. That's right. I mean, no. what, why would you believe that? <laughs> what would give you the idea you. that you could ever convince these people Thank to you. educate your children right? That's right? I don't care how much you protest, how much you demand, they will never do it. What they will end up doing is end up teaching, getting some white folks to teach them Afrocentric orientations. Because anybody in their right minds would know that anyone who has systematically blocked you from knowing for three centuries will not change overnight, over a year, over a decade, over a score of years, or even over a century. The only way we'll ever be able to really educate our children is to do it ourselves. That's the only way. That's the only way. Now, now it, it can work different. Now, that doesn't mean all of us need to pull out of the public schools. The public schools belong to us, too. And there are skills and resources there we can use. But for the real learning, for the learning that will empower them, we have got to depend on us to do that. Everybody else does it. The Japanese do it. The, you're right here in Brooklyn, you know the Jews do it. Everybody does that. They go to public school, get with the public schools guy, then come home and get the real thing from themselves. Right. Every church and every community in America ought to have an afternoon and a weekend school That's to provide additional education. Right. Every mosque, every mosque that has African people in it, I don't care what language they speak in, Arabic, Arabic, Hebrew, Nubian, Hebrew, Arabic, upside down, Ethiopian, whatever. It does not matter. Every one of them, between Salat, they ought to be teaching our children who they are and what they need to be doing for themselves. There's nothing the Caucasian can teach us, nothing, other than how to disrespect nature. If you want to be educated in that, because that's pretty much all you're going to learn. His whole culture, his whole society is how to disrespect nature. Nothing they produce is designed to be in harmony with nature. It's designed to be adverse to nature. And if you build a culture that's adverse to nature, I guarantee you're going to suffer like what's happening today. It ain't just black people suffering. Everyone is suffering under the European system. Everyone who copies it. Why you think Asia, they're suffering too. They're copying, everyone is copying the Caucasian model. 
Racism, white supremacy runs rampant around, uh, throughout this whole planet. There is no solution in their culture. Period. I don't know how many ways to say that. Anyway, let's see. Black people only need black people. You want to stop your suffering? Then rely on each other. I don't know what else to say to that. We don't need anybody but each other. Honestly, stop worrying about Caucasian money. Worry about each other. The number one commodity in existence is a relationship. I repeat that. Stop listening to those psychotics on Wall Street. The number one commodity in existence is a relationship. Capitalism only works because of labor. Without labor, you cannot have a capitalist. The purpose of a capitalist is to exploit labor. That's the purpose of capitalism. That was the purpose of slavery, is to get people to labor for you so that you can re have rest, extra rest and relaxation, comfort and benefits and pleasures from the, from the work and effort of the laborer. That's the purpose of slavery and that is the purpose of capitalism. That's why they see, that's why they show you all the time, the rich and famous is usually where? What are they usually doing? They, they, they like to show you all the time. Yeah, some yacht or they, they vacation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the golf course. Yeah. <laughs> the, you know what I'm saying? And one of they like, what, 10,000 square foot properties? Or yes. Like 20, 50,000 yes. square foot properties or yes. something. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The island somewhere. Capitalism is designed to exploit your labor. Black people, would you stop talking about capitalism? What's wrong with you guys? How could you not comprehend it's designed to exploit labor? Literally. What is labor? Labor, capitalism, the corporation is nothing but a dictatorship. It tells you what time you have to be to work, where you have to work, when you have to work, how you have to work, the way you're supposed to work, who you're supposed to engage in while you're working, what you can and cannot say while you're working, how you know how much time you spend on a job, people? They got you, what, eight hours a day? Yeah, for 30, 30 years plus. Right. <laughs> you know how much control that is? And they call this a so-called democracy. Most people in the United States spend their most of your waking time under a dictatorship of a corporation because you don't have a choice. You need money. And they use money as leverage to control your time. How do they do that? Because of the gun. What's the purpose of the gun? The Caucasian came up with the gun and threatened your life to say that I control property. They control all the land. When you control the land, you control the resources on that land. And then he tells you, in order for you to get resources like food, clothing, and shelter, you have to work for me. So if you need lumber, you got to go to Home Depot and you got to pay money for it. If you need food, you got to go to Walmart. You have to pay money for it. The earth has never charged anyone for an apple. The earth has never charged anyone for a banana. It naturally grows. The earth ain't charged nobody for no tree. No. So it gave a human being to sit there and say they can control land and then force you create fictitious money and then say you got to work for this fictitious money to get something that nature provides for free. Over time, capitalist processes lead to increasing economic instability, inequality, and societal destruction. To understand why, let's take a look at how capitalism functions. Under capitalism, all of the old classes of lords and peasants and craftsmen and merchants have been swept away. Now there are basically just two major classes, 
the capitalists who own the means of production, the factories and farms and other businesses of the world, and the workers who perform the labor that keeps the wheels of the economy turning. Capitalists not only own the means of production, but they also get to keep a significant cut of whatever the worker earns or produces in the form of profit. Basically, capitalist bosses steal labor value from workers and transfer that wealth to themselves. In order for capitalist institutions to survive, they have to turn a profit for the capitalists who own them. Otherwise, they'll be forced out of business by more ruthless competitors. Capitalist institutions literally can't concern themselves with anything but profits, or basically they'll die. Nearly all of the efforts of human civilization are now yoked to the will of capitalists who own the factories, the financial institutions, the mass media, the social networks, the tech companies, the medical and pharmaceutical companies. They own everything. So they get to set the agenda for our society. And what kind of agenda do capitalists have? Well, it's actually really simple. Capitalism steers humanity toward one end and one end only. Ever increasing profits for capitalists. See, capitalists don't really care about the welfare of workers or protecting the environment. They can't, because those things aren't profitable. Capitalism doesn't allow for businesses to be driven by ethics or morals or scruples. Only building profits will allow a company to survive. Anything that reduces profitability is inherently harmful to a capitalist entity. Sure, sometimes profitability does line up with good causes. Sometimes it's cheaper to be more environmentally sustainable, for instance. Or maybe donating to a charity will net a big fat tax break for the capitalist. Or maybe it's just good marketing to support a worthy cause. But this is all just incidental. Don't be fooled for a moment into believing that capitalism cares about the welfare of society. It's all about the profit. Keep in mind that there are only two ways to increase profits. A company can either increase prices for consumers or reduce costs. Competition tends to put a hard limit on what a business can charge, so as businesses become more powerful, they will always seek to eliminate competition and create monopolies so that they can charge consumers as much as possible to maximize company profits. When it comes to driving down costs, the primary cost for almost every business is human labor. As such, capitalist businesses are always seeking to pay workers as little as possible or just eliminate them through things like automation to drive down wages as much as they can get away with. Naturally, this leads to tremendous accumulation of wealth for the capitalist class and ever-increasing wealth inequality between workers and capitalists. By definition, capitalism will always lead to the rich getting richer and the poor getting way more poor. A lot of folks try to argue that capitalism can be reformed, that capitalists can be restrained through regulation and legislation that would put limits on the abuses capitalists can make to the people of the world and to our environment. This liberal position cruelly ignores the fact that even the most effective regulations and reforms do nothing to correct the power imbalances of society. Any such reforms are destined to be inadequate because they don't disrupt who ultimately holds the power in the system. As long as capitalists hold the reins of the means of production, they will always hold virtually limitless power over society. Another major myth about capitalism is the idea of meritocracy. Capitalist propaganda seeks to convince us that hard work and good ideas will rise to the top and that anyone can become a rich capitalist if they're willing to play the game. Unfortunately, that game is severely rigged such that for every worker who does manage to break into the capitalist cast of billionaires, there are millions of workers who suffer in toil and misery from the cradle to the grave. Some folks say that if we got rid of capitalism, universal laziness would take over society and nobody would work anymore because there'd be no incentive. This position ignores the fact that in capitalist society, the people who work the hardest make the least amount of money, and the people with the greatest fortunes, the capitalists, live out their days in luxurious laziness. Capitalism is an engine that robs wealth from the working people of the world and transfers it to a small number of capitalists who feel entitled to our money. It had its time and place in history. It was admittedly a great step forward from feudalism, but it's outworn its usefulness and now's the time for capitalism to be dismantled so that humanity can fulfill our true potential. There's a lot more to be said about capitalism. In my next video, we'll talk more about wages and profits and how capitalists steal the labor value of workers. So click subscribe if you want to stick around for that. In the meantime, you can check out my blog at non-compete.com where I have a lot more articles about stuff like this. I'm American Johnson, this is Non-Compete. Thanks for watching. So again, it's designed to exploit your labor, and that's why you're suffering, because you are being exploited, your labor is being exploited, you're working for someone for all, whatever kind of time, under whatever stress, because again, the corporation is a dictatorship. You're told what to do on every level, okay? And, and until we learn to build harmonious relationships with each other, that's the only solution to the problem. As long as we keep living this insane, crazy culture, 
we're going to continue to suffer. That's what I'm trying to warn you guys about. <clears throat> anyway, black people only need black people. Ignorance, and here's the thing, ignorance is a disease that can only be cured with right knowledge. This is what we teach as Nawapians. Ignorance, you're making all these insane decisions because of your ignorance. And you, you can only correct your ignorance by having right knowledge. And only us, Nawapians, are the ones who teach and right knowledge. No one else. No one else. And this is not for me to sound like I'm egotistical or anything like that. But it's just the reality. You're not going to get right knowledge from anybody. Anywhere. Nowhere on the planet. We're the ones with the right information. We're the ones explaining exactly what we're supposed to do, why we're supposed to do it, and the solution to all of these problems. And I'm not saying that just to toot the horn, our horn as Nawapians. I'm saying that as, in real talk, man. Real talk. I, I know we're suffering. I've, I've, I've seen enough. And so, again, as Nawapians, the master teacher, Dr. Malachi Z.K. York, he's been warning our people for years. We're stubborn. It's black people, we're stubborn. We don't want to listen. We don't want to listen. We keep running to the Caucasian. It's, it's, it's sad with their poison culture. And you're wondering why, you didn't, why you're suffering. I don't know. But ignorance kills more people in the, in the world than any other disease. Ignorance is a disease. And it kills more people in the world than anything else. You must learn to make decisions based on actual facts. That's the only way you can get rid of the disease of ignorance. By making decisions based on what you know, not what you believe. It's a cruel thing that got people believing that if they live a certain life, they're going to go to heaven. That's a cruel, you know, I work and I just do not do good, pay my taxes, don't bother nobody, you know, and then, then I'm going to die and I'm going to go to heaven. That's a cruel joke. You don't want to make a decision like that. You don't want to lead, base your whole life, okay, believing that that's your end reward. And you don't even know what the word heaven actually means. And obviously, you didn't say that in the Bible because the Bible wasn't written in English. No. Alright. Last one. Suffering ends once we are liberated from adverse forces. I repeat, your suffering, our suffering as a people will only end once we are liberated from adverse forces. The conditions that's actually creating the suffering. And I'm trying to convince you and explain to you guys, it's European culture that's creating the suffering. And you're not going to have any kind of liberated feeling until you liberate yourself from European culture. And there's no, there is no other option. Stop listening to those disagreeable ex-students of Nawapo. They wanted to be a part of European culture because we've been conditioned. And you know, I guess one of the problems is, is that, again, our people, oh, do they actually realize that they're suffering? They do. Well, you'd have to define but, what's suffering. Yeah. Yeah. You have to define what's suffering, because that's unfortunately what you, something you've always told me. Um, because we don't have anything to compare it to, we don't know what it feels like to be living in our culture without rulership, having access to resources of our own, living at our highest potential. So you don't know what to compare. Yeah, it to. I, that, I'll say that people, you guys will not be really comprehend what suffering is till you understand what it means to live true African culture. Unfortunately, if you look at, Af at, at the African continent today, you're not going to really find it. We as the Wapians are the only ones who actually are teaching true African culture. It takes a lot of studying to comprehend it though, I will admit to that. It took me years to get to where I'm at, to even begin to have these types of discussions and lectures with people where I actually know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking from a position of belief. I'm talking from a, a position of actual knowledge, actual facts. And I, but I will say this, and here, here are actual facts. So we as black people, when we ruled ourselves, we did not have 
the type of problems you see in this society. The, the, the drug problem we're dealing with, the health problems we're dealing with, the abuse problems we're dealing with, the crime problems we're dealing with, the racist problems we're dealing with. I mean, the, the problems we're dealing with is, uh, is just prejudice. It's, uh, it's unimaginable. The, the thievery, the greed, the, the lust, it's, 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 oof. What they say, I think they said, um, that guy, he, he, he said that the por the pornography, no, what did he say? Pornography is making more than Hollywood? Yeah. Pornography is making more than Hollywood. Pornography are specifically targeting 12 and 18 year olds. Pornography guys is specifically targeting 12 and 18 year olds. Really? People, children, our, our, our developing minds, our children, our young adults, our young pioneers, our future are being perverted when it comes to their, how they should interpret sexual relationships, which is what pornography is designed to do. It's designed to miseducate you about sex. Twenty-five. The sex industry is the largest and most profitable industry in the world. This includes street prostitution, strip clubs, phone sex, and pornography. Twenty-four. Thirteen thousand adult videos are produced annually, amassing over thirteen billion dollars in profit. By comparison, Hollywood released five hundred and seven movies and made only eight point eight billion. Twenty-three. The porn industry also makes more money than the National Football League, the National Basketball Association, and Major League Baseball combined. They also make more than NBC, CBS, and ABC combined. And if that's not enough, they have larger revenues than top technology companies such as Microsoft, Google, Amazon, eBay, Yahoo, Apple, and Netflix combined. 22. At any given second of the day, there are as much as 30 million unique visitors visiting porn sites. This means that there are about 30 million unique visitors viewing porn right now. And now. And now. 17. Just about half of the internet is made up of porn or porn-related content. 16. A University of Montreal study found that most guys are exposed to porn for the first time at age 10. 15. Presidential elections seem to influence porn consumption. In 2004, after President Bush won the election, conservative states, red states, saw an increase in porn-related internet searches, while in 2008, after Obama won, liberal states, blue states, saw an increase in porn-related searches. 14. There are over 68 million daily searches for pornography in the United States, which is about 25% of all daily searches. 11. The United States is the top producer of pornographic DVDs and web material. The second largest is Germany. 10. In fact, every 39 minutes a new porn film is created in the United States. 4. Internet porn in the UK receives more traffic than social networks, shopping, gaming, finance, and travel. 3. Several recent studies have found that teenagers from all over the world use porn to learn about real-life sex. 2. Though true, women do watch porn, most studies show that women watch far less porn than men. And one, 10% of adults admit to legitimately have an online porn addiction. And we're wondering, when you miseducate people about sex, sex is a power, it's a force. It's, a, it's the second most powerful force in existence, the sex force. And when you miseducate, miseducate people about the sex force, it is designed to degenerate a people. This is what the Caucasian did to us during slavery. He miseducated us about the sex force, and that's why they use sex in all their forms of marketing and advertisement and in movies and entertainment. It's always pushing sex because sex, they know it's a powerful force, and it is designed, if it's used in a wrong and adverse way, it's designed to destroy a people. And that's what the sex has done to black people, which is why the Caucasians all use, always use sex scandals to, to defame and dethrone black men. Right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, Bill Cosby, and, and, right? right? Uh, Marion Barry, the ex-mayor of uh, Washington, D.C., and, and 
Martin Luther King, hint, hint. Honorable Elijah Muhammad, hint, hint. Noble Jura Lee, all of them, sex. Mm. All of them, sex. The Dr. York ain't the only one I got caught up in sex. Uh, Yahweh Ben Yahweh, sex. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, 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 it's like a, it's like the fail safe, the Caucasian fail safe. We gotta get him in a sex scandal. Yeah. I'll repeat, suffering ends once we're liberated from adverse forces. The Caucasian, how are you going to blame black women, excuse me, black men for getting caught up in the sex scandal when this is a cultural phenomenon of the Caucasian? This is not an African thing. Everybody walked around naked on the island. I mean, hundreds of people. And I never saw a guy stare at a female body that was brought up there. They were swimming nude ever since they were kids. So the guys only looked at the girls' eyes. Can you understand that? They never had to get a load of that shit. They never spoke <laughs> like that. That's the way they speak in this so-called civilized country. But in the South Pacific, <coughs> When they were 13 or 14, they had sex, and they never talked about it. It was normal to them. In this world of civilization, guys buy girly magazines. They do. You couldn't sell a nude picture in the islands, because they all walk around nude. So the way we behave is not normal. To say, well, girls say, well, you know how men are. That isn't how they are. That's how they're made by this culture. Does anybody have trouble with what I said? No. All right. We had, we had rules and regulations and cultural procedures when it came to how we dealt with sex and relationships and our, and our wives, our mates. It didn't get perverted until we started incorporating European concepts into our culture. And that's why we're getting caught up in these sex, sex, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, scandals, situation, or whatever you want to call it. You know, we're getting caught up because everything that black people are doing that's considered bad, we learn from the master of it. Yeah, sexual deviant behavior. <laughs> we, learn, yeah. we learn from the Caucasian. Yeah. All of it. All of it. So we're not doing it because we're doing it by nature. We're doing it by cultural condition. That can be fixed. You can fix us. You can't fix, I don't know how you can fix the Caucasian from, you know, correcting a lifestyle that that's what they, that's how they lived. That's how they lived. So, which had nothing to do with us. We're not the cause of why they behave the way they behave culturally. They came up with pornography, not us. They came up with molesting children. We didn't invent that stuff. All this rape and pillaging, that's them. We didn't come up with that. Capitalism praises people in taking advantage of the unintelligent. What did Trump talk about with the whole tax thing? Yeah, well, he said that um, I think he was in a debate with Hillary, and she was talking about, um, she was bringing up the fact that he didn't pay certain taxes certain years and he said well it's not my fault y'all are stupid I, that makes me smarter right yeah this is i'm right so wait, you're supposed to pay taxes for the benefit of the state mm -hmm. right i will release my tax returns against my lawyer's wishes when she releases her 33,000 emails that have been deleted as soon as she releases them i will release i will release my tax returns. So you've got to ask yourself, why won't he release his tax returns? And I think there may be a couple of reasons. First, maybe he's not as rich as he says he is. Second, maybe he's not as charitable as he claims to be. Third, we don't know all of his business dealings, but we have been told through investigative reporting that 
He owes about $650 million to Wall Street and foreign banks. Or maybe he doesn't want the American people, all of you watching tonight, to know that he's paid nothing in federal taxes because the only years that anybody's ever seen were a couple of years when he had to turn them over to state authorities when he was trying to get a casino license and they showed he didn't pay any federal income tax. So that makes if me he's smart. paid zero, that means zero for troops, zero for vets, zero for schools or health. The New York Times published three pages of your 1995 tax returns. They show you claimed a $916 million loss, which means you could have avoided paying personal federal income taxes for years. You've said you pay state taxes, employee taxes, real estate taxes, property taxes. You have not answered, though, a simple question. Did you use that $916 million loss to avoid paying personal federal income taxes? For of course I do. Of course I do. And so do all of her donors or most of her donors. I know many of her donors. Her donors took massive tax write-offs. So have a you lot of my, excuse me, a, a lot of my write-off was depreciation and other things that Hillary as a senator allowed. And she'll always allow it because the people that give her all this money, they want it. That's why. See, I understand the tax code better than anybody that's ever run for president. Hillary Clinton, and it's extremely complex, Hillary Clinton has friends that want all of these provisions, including they want the carried interest provision, which is very important to Wall Street people, but they really want the carried interest provision, which I believe Hillary's leaving. It's very interesting why she's leaving carried interest, but I will tell you that, number one, I pay tremendous numbers of taxes. I absolutely used it, and so did Warren Buffett, and so did George Soros, and so did many of the other people that Hillary is uh, getting money from. Now, I won't mention their names because they're rich, but they're not famous, so we won't make them famous. Okay? Can, you, can you say how many years you have avoided paying personal federal income taxes? No, but I, I pay tax, and I pay federal tax, too. But I have a write-off. A lot of it's depreciation, which is a wonderful charge. I love depreciation. You know, she's given it to us. But now here's Trump. He's, he's, he feels good about how he's able to take advantage of the system. He's rich, by the way. How he can take advantage of the system by not paying taxes. And the whole purpose of paying taxes is to help the Support country. Support the country, yeah. Right. But you're rewarded for cheating the system. You feel proud. And that's what capitalism is about. If I can take advantage of you, I'm rewarded for that. People, listen. That's a culture that's designed to create suffering. Taking advantage of people. If I can take advantage of people's labor, that's why the um, history of corporations were designed to destroy the um, labor union. You know, and, and understand why labor unions even existed. You know, the work week was just supposed to be was like seven days a week, some yeah, insanity, yeah, yeah. and from sun up to sundown. Sun they even had children <laughs> working and all that stuff. Yeah, it just this is a capitalism. Yeah, yeah. It was because people rebel. They were rebelling, which is why they had to change these laws, these conditions. This is what created labor unions, so that the corporation wouldn't take advantage. Let me just say this about that incident. That incident in, I think, in St. Louis I was telling you about in 19... What was it? 1917 or something like that. They killed like 3,000 brothers and sisters. They mm -hmm. lynched us. Murdered us. Mm -hmm. And you know why they murdered us? We'll put it up. Yeah, you're talking about that from the, um, taking over the job. We crossed the picket line. They took advantage. They tricked us. They got black people from... What was it from Alabama, Mississippi, or something to move into St. Louis, right? And they and they advertised that we can get these jobs. Where what happened was they was giving us jobs that white people who lived in that area were striking. They didn't want to work for the company because the company was taking advantage of, of the people. So with the with the with the um because the the, the owner of the corporation didn't want to pay the workers you know, adequate wages, he brought in black people who work for cheaper. Mm -hmm. And you know, that got the white people in the town pissed off. And that caused, and they said uh, as close as 2,000 people, something like that, they killed. They slaughtered us. We'll put the information up. They slaughtered black people. And so, 
I repeat, the suffering will not stop until you're liberated from the culture that is creating the suffering. So, as always, support what we do, right? Thumbs up. Become members of NupuCC.com, right? Spread the word. And peace. Yeah.